have Associate Professor Trevor Mazzucchelli. Trevor is an Associate Professor of Clinical Psychology at Curtin University, and he will be talking to us about NDIS and parenting support uh, today. So Trevor, take it away. Oh, terrific. Thanks, Sylvia. Okay, so yes, welcome to this seminar on the National Disability Insurance Scheme and Parenting Support. And I should acknowledge right at the outset that this presentation represents the work of the PAFRA NDIS Advocacy Group, and it's a team effort by our members, including Bruce Tong, Sharon Dorr, Avril Brereton, Kirsten Baird-Bate, and Catherine Wade. And before I go any further, I'd like you to know that I'm coming to you from Wajak Butja, where I pay my respect to Elders past, present and emerging. Just to put this presentation into context, let's first consider how the NDIS came about. And this requires a step back in time and considering the history of support for people with a disability in Australia. Throughout the 19th and early 20th century, the institutionalisation of people with disability was a common practice in Australia. Large institutions housing sometimes hundreds of people with different types of disability was common in most states. And pictured here is the Fremantle Lunatic Asylum, an invalid depot, which opened in 1865. It was the permanent home for many West Australians with mental illness and intellectual disability. These institutions operated like prisons, and if you look closely, you can maybe see that the residents in the garden are wearing a uniform. They had to get up, eat, and go to bed at set times. For children living in asylums, parents might only be able to visit for a few hours a month. Confining people with disability to institutions was considered the best way to protect them from themselves and to safeguard society. There were fears that if they weren't locked away, they would descend into lives of homelessness, crime and drunkenness. Prior to Federation in 1901, almost all support for people with disability came from an individual's family or from donations from churches and charities. The notion that people with disability were entitled to funding or support didn't exist. They were viewed as dependent on the will of others and, un and unable to make decisions about how to live their own lives. Shortly after Federation, in 1908, the newly formed Commonwealth Government made Australia one of the first countries to introduce a nationwide government-funded income support system through the introduction of the Invalid Pension, known today as the Disability Support Pension. Both the First and Second World Wars led to a rapid increase in the number of people with disability. To cope with increasing demand for support, the Commonwealth Government began to consider alternative forms of care to asylums and institutions. The Commonwealth Rehabilitation Service was established in 1941 as the first government-funded rehabilitation program in Australia. Another important shift during this time was the expansion of the role of volunteer and charity organisations. There was significant expansion of the number of sheltered workshops and accommodation services run by volunteer and charity organisations. There was also a rapid increase in the formation of associations for people with disability, often set up with and by people with disability and their families. These organisations tended to focus on improving quality of living, as well as searching for medical cures and rehabilitation opportunities. With additional government and organisational supports, more and more people with disability were able to live outside of institutional settings. However, although more often physically located within communities, people with disability still found themselves frequently excluded from many mainstream services and limited in the choices they could make about how to live their lives. Separate schools, transportation and infrastructure was still the norm. During the 1950s and 1960s, Australia's Commonwealth and state governments increasingly provided funding through disability organisations for accommodation, employment and other support services. However, the real shift in the way disability services were provided came as part of the international disability rights movement. 
disability advocacy groups fighting for disability rights across the globe departed from the view that disability was just a health condition to be treated or cured. They understood disability as the outcome of environmental barriers put in place by society, which unwittingly excluded individuals with disability by organizing itself only with those without disability in mind. From the 1970s through to the 1990s, Australia introduced a range of initiatives to more actively recognize and support equal rights and opportunities of people with disability. In 1986, it introduced the Disability Services Act, which provided a comprehensive framework for the funding and provision of disability support services across Australia. In 1991, the first Commonwealth State Disability Agreement was signed to reduce the amount of duplication and complexity in dis disability funding and service arrangements. And the agreement gave the Commonwealth responsibility for income support and employment services, and the states and territories responsibility for accommodation and other support services. In 2007, the United Nations adopted the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, which was ratified by Australia. This viewed persons with disability as subjects with rights who are capable of making decisions about their own lives based on their free and informed consent, as well as being active members of society. Personalisation has been a key driver of changes to Australia's disability support system in recent years and has shaped the design of the NDIS. And there's a spectrum of personalisation. From the shallow end, personalisation is just a user-friendly interface with existing services. On the deep end, individuals can directly commission, co-design and co-produce services. Self-directed care is now closely associated with providing individual budgets to people for their care. And under this arrangement, individuals can purchase the various supports they need. Throughout the 1980s, 1990s, small scale <coughs> personalization and self-directed funding projects for people with disability were set up in multiple states with the intention of promoting greater choice and control with more flexible and responsive services. Unfortunately, by the start of the 21st century, Australia's disability support system and outcomes for those who relied on it was far from ideal. Under Commonwealth state disability agreements, Commonwealth funding allocations for disability supports were based on the previous year's funding adjusted for indexation, rather than an estimate of the actual support needs of people with disability. This meant that many people were not getting enough services or were not getting services at all. In 2008, Prime Minister Kevin Rudd held the 2020 summit to discuss critical policy areas for Australia's future. A proposal for a lifetime care and support scheme for people with disability was put forward and supported at the summit. In 2009, a confronting report titled, Shut Out, the experiences of people with disabilities and their families in Australia was published. The shut out report concluded that Australia's disability system was broken and broke. Submissions to shut out also noted that programs and services seem to be built around the needs of organisations rather than the needs of individuals. The existing funding model was not portable. Someone receiving services in one state might move to another state and no longer receive services. And there were problems with service access, quality, and one size fits all approaches. Many people called for a fundamental change of the system, calling for individualized flexible funding packages that people could spend how they saw fit. The Productivity Commission subsequently released a report in 2011 that echoed the conclusions of the shutout report and recommended that an NDIS be introduced to provide insurance cover for all Australians in the event of disability. The NDIS described by the Productivity Commission combined influences from Australia's disability sector with elements of, ex of its existing accident compensation schemes. It reflected the growing influence of personalization within social services, describing a service model which would provide participants with individualized funding and support packages tailored to their unique goals and needs. 
Similar to contemporary accident compensation schemes, the NDIS described was to be overseen by an independent statutory authority, the National Disability Insurance Agency. The NDIS was legislated in 2013 and went into full operation in 2020. What a celebration. We've come a long way from the routine segregation and institutionalization of people with disability. And the NDIS truly represents one of the most important social reforms in Australian history. Although the NDIS has clearly helped many people, there have been a range of criticisms of the NDIS, including plans not being made with the input of people who understand the particular disability, difficulties finding needed services, and delays in services or equipment being provided. The funding of fringe therapies such as chanting and tarot card reading, corruption and fraudulent claims, and budget blowouts and questions around the sustainability of the entire system. Of particular concern to us are reports from parents that it's difficult to access parenting support and from organisations and practitioners who used to provide support that they are no longer able to do so. So why might there be less parenting support under the NDIS system? Well, for a start, there appears to be a lack of clarity around who is responsible for providing parenting support. According to the NDIS guidelines, the NDIS is responsible for supports that are specific to a child's developmental delay or disability, which certainly sounds promising. After all, the literature tells us that of all the supports that can influence a child's development, none are more important than the supports they receive in their home. However, the only reference to parenting programs in the guidelines comes in the section on what child protection and family support systems should be offering. Is it that the NDIS will not fund parenting support? What's well, confusing because we know that parents do access parenting support through the NDIS. In fact, third party organisations such as Children and Young People with Disability Australia recognise the importance of parenting support and provide guidance to parents on how to access it. You can see here an excerpt from one of their fact sheets that reads, as a parent or carer of your child or young person with disability, you can receive funding to improve your ability to support them to achieve their goals. Some examples of training for your caring role include understanding challenging behaviour and supporting positive behaviour. We also know that the NDIS can pay for training for carers and parents because it's in their price guide. Training parents and carers to care for a person with a disability is remunerated at $71 per hour. However, it seems that there may be a financial incentive to provide individual direct therapy services to the child. Therapies such as occupational therapy and speech pathology are remunerated at almost three times the rate, $194 per hour. Psychology at more than three times the rate. To further understand why there may be less parenting support, it may be helpful to understand the pathway to support through the NDIS. The personalized funding model of the NDIS relies on people with a disability and their families having the knowledge and capacity to understand and prioritize their support needs. Making informed decisions regarding which services will best meet these needs. Advocating with a NDIS local area planner for desired services. The NDIS planner understanding the needs, budgeting funding and assisting the parent connect with suitable services and service providers making the desired supports available and accessible to parents and carers. We believe that there may be barriers at each of these steps. It's important to remember that it is parents and carers who are the ultimate decision makers as to what services they'll access for their child. They may not be aware that parenting support, including parent-mediated therapy interventions, will benefit their child, 
perhaps even more so than therapy services delivered directly to the child. Consider the thousands of potential teaching opportunities that arise naturally over the course of each day that parents could take advantage of, each opportunity being contextually appropriate for the learning to be meaningful and functional for the child. For parents who have a disability themselves, there can be concerns that requests for parenting support may lead to a referral to child protection, as suggested by the NDIS guidelines. NDIS planners may not be aware of the benefits and existence of parenting programs. They might also believe that any kind of parenting support is the responsibility of child protection and that concerning child behaviour should be addressed through the mental health system. For service providers, there may be a financial incentive to provide direct therapy services rather than working through parents. Also, cost-effective group parenting programs previously delivered when organisations were block funded are now less likely to be provided because they require multiple parents to independently, contemporaneously request the same service. Does it matter if less parenting support is accessed by parents raising a child with a disability? We absolutely believe it does. The research is unequivocal of all the potentially modifiable environmental factors that influence children's development, none is more important than the quality of parenting children receive. Parents are uniquely placed to provide an optimal environment for children's development. And there is overwhelming evidence that young children with disability and their families benefit from tailored parenting support. Parenting support programs tailored for children with disability is associated with enhanced language and communication, more developed social skills, greater independent living skills, strengthened emotional regulation, and better mental health outcomes. These changes have been shown to endure over time. But the benefits don't just stop there. Benefits have also been found for other family members, including parents having enhanced parenting skills, less conflict in the home, less stress for parents and siblings, and happier family relationships. And these factors are vital when thinking about increasing parents' capacity to support their children's development and ensuring that a child's informal support system endures over time. I want to show you a video now of a parent with an intellectual disability who access support through the NDIS. It's a success story that provides insight into the powerful impact the NDIS can make to the lives of families. This video is part of a suite of resources for parents with intellectual disability that the Parenting Research Centre and the Raising Children Network developed to support parents' understanding of the NDIS, and its development was funded by the NDIA. Hi Ash, thanks for your time today. Thanks for coming to talk to me about your experiences with NDIS. Well, tell me about sort of day-to-day -day parenting in your house. Like how are things shared between the two of you? I guess it's shared between us. Get up, they have recce, and then get ready for daycare and then go to take it. So the NDIS stands for National Disability Insurance Scheme. What was happening in your life around the time that you got on the NDIS? Were you a mum then? No, I think I was becoming a mum. So it was just before you were pregnant around that yeah. time with your first son? What sorts of things do you use NDIS funding for? Supports for like shopping, just maintaining stuff in the house. And at the moment we're doing like driving lessons as well. Do people come into the home to help you with other stuff, like stuff to do with your parenting? Uh, not so much parenting, but like just help, help with maintaining and stuff. Maybe if we talk a little bit more about when you first got on the NDIS and when your first child, your son, was born, was it a difficult time for you? People were starting to question whether you could be a parent, whether you should be a parent and that sort of stuff? It was a difficult time. But we got by with the help that was provided. What sort of help was provided? I had one person come in 
to do overnight stays. For about a week, I think, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah. So you had someone come into the home and help to show you how to do things. Yes. Having someone there who can support you and show you how to breastfeed or make up formula or put a baby down who's not, you know, who's crying and not sleeping well. Mm -hmm. They stayed overnight. Did they stay during the day as well? No. So I had time to myself through the day um, and they'd just come back of a night time. And if you had difficulties during the day, did you have someone you could call to ask for help or...? Yeah, but I was pretty much all right. The other thing that's important with um, NDIS is that it's your money, right? You have the choice and the control over the money. And what sort of stuff do you choose to spend it on? At the moment, I'm doing, like, as I said, like, um, learning to drive and stuff. So how? So you sat down with a worker or a planner, I think they call them, and you... And they, they had a conversation about your goals, probably. And so you told them that one of your goals was to learn to drive. To get my P's. To get your P's, yeah. What other things would you choose to use, would you like to use the NDIS money for? I guess going out a bit more. Mm-hmm. Maybe going to mum groups. Yeah, have you ever done a mum's group? Was doing a few, but then they all finished. What sort of stuff did you do there? It was just mainly talking about, like, the behaviours with your children and talking mm-hmm. about things. What else has been the, the most helpful thing for you in having the NDIS? I guess people coming in and helping, getting me motivated. So the, the people that you work with, you find them, like people that come into your home, you find them quite encouraging and motivating. Yeah. Okay. Is it sometimes hard to find the right person, the right the right match between you and a worker? Yeah, it is. Like I've had some one, like some that I didn't like really much. And are you able to be clear about that? Like are you able to say I don't want that person coming or well, uh, well I have in the past. That's good. That's that's how it should be because one of the ideas of the NDIS is you have choice, right? You can say I want this but I don't want that. So you went to your coordinator and you said you weren't happy and you weren't being listened to. What did they say when you told them that? I think they were proud of me for, like, standing up for myself. And what difference did that make to your life when you spoke up and had a voice? Pretty much changed everything. Like, Don't I was me. able to have a choice in what I wanted to spend my money on. That's good. That's a good example of you using your choice and control. I guess it makes me feel like I'm a more an adult. More of an adult, yeah. And, and I get to have a choice in life. Because ultimately you're the one who knows your children best. It's important that you're the one making the, the decisions about what happens to them and what's important for you and your family. Yeah, I just felt more freedom. What would you say to other parents who are feeling like you were five or six years ago, like out of, you know, like you didn't have control of your life? What would what would be the message you would give other parents like that? Speak up, because we all should have a say. Because your kids are going to learn from that too, aren't they? If they see mum standing up for herself, yes. And if if a parent was saying to you oh, this NDIS thing, yeah, I've heard about it. I I reckon I probably could get it, but I looked at the form. It's too confusing. I can't be bothered. What would you tell them? Hopefully with my parenting, was able to keep my children. That's a pretty big outcome. That's pretty big positive out of that one. Thank you. All right, thank you, Ash, for coming to have a chat with me today. And you've got one on the way. Yes. (laughs) Yes. <laughs> yes. So what are you looking forward to for this little bub? Them growing up together, just seeing them happy. Mm. So what an outcome. A parent is able to keep her children. And I think it's clear that by providing parenting support, the NDIS has an important role to play in enhancing the lives of children and parents with disability. And I want to acknowledge the wonderful Catherine Wade as the interviewer there. So what do we think should happen? Well, we think that the NDIS should maintain a list of best practice parenting programs for children and parents with disability that can be used as a resource to inform the decision-making of parents, carers, 
NDIS planners and service providers. Purveyors of parenting support programs should develop and evaluate low intensity disability specific parent support options, including online options to increase reach and affordability of parenting support, particularly for families living in rural and remote areas. Health professionals undertaking developmental assessments, for instance, to determine children's eligibility for NDA support should make recommendations on how best how to best support each child's development to inform decision-making of carers and NDIS planners. Training to carers and parenting support should be remunerated at the same rate as capacity building supports delivered individually to the person with a disability. And finally, we think that the NDIS should track and provide aggregated data on the nature of supports funded so that the delivery of parenting support provided through the NDIS can be tracked over time. And what have we been doing to address these barriers? We've been raising awareness of the policy ambiguity and the importance of parenting support through professional publications. Um, we've recently had a manuscript accepted with the Australian and New Zealand Journal of Psychiatry. We've been challenging the idea that parenting support is just about behaviour problems or mental health. We've done this through our submission to last year's Joint Standing Committee inquiry on the NDIS. We've also commenced systematic reviews of evidence that parenting support can promote children's daily living skills. We've been attempting to raise awareness to parents and planners of the benefits of parenting support through online news publications and the social media. And we intend continuing our efforts, including through a submission to the current NDIS review and advocacy with policymakers. In terms of disclosures, um, I want to alert you that I am an, a co-author of the Stepping Stones Triple P program. Bruce Tong and Avril Brereton are authors of Preschoolers with Autism. Sharon Dorr is a developer of Parents Under Pressure. Catherine Wade is a developer of Parenting Young Children. And Kirsten Baird-Bate and I have a child with autism and access NDIS support. I want to sincerely thank you for your interest in this topic. It's one that we think is extremely important. And um, our team um, would welcome your comments, questions, and any suggestions you have for us. Thank you.